The case of Krista Gale Pike is a disturbing and gruesome one. Krista Pike, one of the youngest women to be sentenced to death in the United States, was convicted of torturing and murdering her classmate, Colleen Slemmer, in 1995. Krista Pike was born to her mother, Carissa Hansen, and her father, Glenn Pike, on March 10, 1976, in West Virginia. Unwanted by either parent, she frequently moved homes between her mother's residence in Tennessee and her father's in West Virginia. This instability led to her changing schools a total of 12 times by the time she earned her GED in 1993. Raised mainly by her grandmother due to her mother's struggles with alcoholism and repeated abuse by her father, she flourished as an eager student during her early years. However, her life took a drastic turn when her grandmother passed away when Krista was 12. Following the death of her grandmother, Krista reportedly attempted suicide. She then moved in with her mostly absent mother. In 1989, at 13 years old, Krista was sexually assaulted by her mother's boyfriend. Following the attack, she was removed by children's services but returned shortly after. With the lack of guidance, Krista began to experiment with alcohol and drugs, which eventually led to her arrest for shoplifting. This resulted in her serving a one-year sentence in juvenile detention. It was during this time, under the strict rules and structure of the facility, that she began to find stability and a path to personal growth. Following her release, she decided to join Job Corp in Knoxville, Tennessee. Job Corp, a program designed for troubled and economically disadvantaged teenagers, provided room and board while offering students the opportunity to pursue their education and gain career skills over a span of up to three years. Krista aspired to become a nurse technician as she embarked on this new chapter of her life. During her time at Job Corp, Krista Pike crossed paths with Tatterall Ship, from Memphis, Tennessee. To Darrell's life had its share of challenges, as he lived with his mother, while the absence of his father left a significant impact on him. Struggling in high school, he eventually dropped out during the ninth grade. His life took a turn when he began using drugs and associating with known gang members, causing concern for his mother. In response to his troubled path, to Darrell's mother encouraged him to enroll in Job Corp. At the age of 17, he joined the program, enrolling in the culinary arts program it offered. It was at Job Corp that Krista and Tatterall, two individuals with shared experiences and interests, quickly developed a close and intense relationship. According to their classmates, their connection was deep and rooted in love. Notably, Tatterall harbored a strong fascination with satanic worship and the occult. Together, they dabbled in practicing devil worship and went on to form a satanic group within the Job Corp community. One of the students who joined their friend group was Shadola Renee Peterson, from Cleveland, Tennessee. In October 1994, another student named Colleen Slemmer joined the Job Corp program in Knoxville, Tennessee. Colleen, at the age of 19, had arrived from Orange Park, Florida, where she had previously worked in the restaurant industry. Her goal at Job Corp was to study computer technology and later pursue a career in that field. According to her mother, Colleen was an awesome and giving person who had a passion for helping disabled children. At the Job Corps, Krista had often gotten in trouble for her aggressive behavior and fights with other students. Over the following three months, tensions escalated between her and Colleen. Krista accused Colleen of making advances and flirting with Tatterall suggesting that Colleen was attempting to steal him away from her. Colleen's friends and classmates strongly deny these allegations, claiming she was always friendly with other students, but had no romantic interest in Tatterall. As the conflict between Colleen and Krista persisted, Krista decided to take action. On January 11, 1995, Krista confided in a classmate, Kim Iloilo, revealing her intention to kill Colleen because she was feeling mean that day. However, her classmate initially dismissed this as mere talk, not fully comprehending the horrifying events that would ultimately transpire. On the following day, January 12, 1995, at approximately 8 p.m., Kim Iloilo witnessed Krista, Colleen, Tatterall, and Shadola leaving the Job Corp Center. Krista had informed Colleen that she wanted to smoke marijuana together as a peace offering. Little did Colleen know that Krista had come prepared with a box cutter and a small meat cleaver. Upon their arrival at a steam plant on the University of Tennessee, Knoxville campus, Krista initiated her brutal attack on Colleen. 
She accused Colleen of attempting to have a romantic involvement with Tatterall, and when Colleen denied these accusations, Krista viciously struck and kicked her in the head with her knee. She then forcefully threw Colleen to the ground, continuing to inflict harm. Tatterall was watching the attack, while Shadola served as a lookout during this violent encounter. Eventually, Colleen was able to get up and make an attempt to flee, though Tatterall quickly caught up to her and pushed her back to the ground. The group then dragged her to another location, where Krista started to cut her with a meat cleaver. Colleen repeatedly tried to get up and run, bargaining and begging for her life, but Krista continued her brutal attack. When Colleen didn't stop talking, Krista told her to shut up. She later stated it was harder to hurt somebody when they're talking to you. The group ordered Colleen to take off her shirt and bra to prevent her from running away. Krista removed her hairband and tied it around Colleen's mouth to keep her from screaming. She then started to slash Colleen's throat multiple times with the box cutter. After holding her down and carving a pentagram into Colleen's chest, Krista picked up a large chunk of concrete and repeatedly hit Colleen in the head, killing her. Eventually, Krista asked Colleen, Do you know who's doing this to you? But Colleen could only respond with groaning noises. Krista then picked up a fragment of Colleen's skull and put it in her pocket. At this point, Krista and Tatterall dragged Colleen to an area hidden by trees and left her body on a pile of dirt. They left her clothing in the surrounding bushes and washed their hands and shoes in a mud puddle. Krista got rid of the box cutter and returned the meat cleaver to the person she had borrowed it from. To conceal the blood on her jeans, Krista rubbed mud from her shoes on them. They then discarded two of Colleen's ids and her black gloves at a Texaco station. Around 10.15 p.m., Kim Iloilo noticed that Krista, Tatterall, and Shadola had come back to Job Corp., but Colleen was not among them. At approximately 11 p.m., Krista went to Kim's room and confessed to killing Colleen and that she had brought back a piece of Colleen's skull as a souvenir. She showed Kim the fragment and told her that she had cut Colleen's throat six times and had thrown a block of asphalt at her. Krista also told Kim that a pentagram had been carved on Colleen's chest and forehead. Kim later recalls Krista dancing in circles, smiling and singing, while she told Kim about the murder. The following day, Krista proudly displayed a fragment of Colleen's skull and boasted about the murder to additional students during breakfast. In the midst of their morning class, she gestured to brown stains on her shoes and remarked to her classmate Stephanie Wilson, That's not mud on my shoes, it's blood. Subsequently, she revealed the skull fragment to Stephanie. Neither Stephanie nor Kim reported the incident to the authorities. Simultaneously, Colleen's lifeless body was found. A couple on their early morning stroll stumbled upon a sizable pool of blood, prompting them to alert a nearby groundskeeper. Together, they traced the trail of bloodstains to the distressing sight of Colleen's lifeless body, sprawled face down in the grass. During testimony, the employee revealed that the extent of her injuries was so severe that he initially mistook her for an animal carcass. As officers from the Knoxville, Tennessee Police Department arrived, they noted that Colleen was lying on debris and was nude from the waist up. Blood and dirt covered the body and remaining clothing. Her head was badly bludgeoned and multiple cuts and slashes appeared on the victim's torso. According to an officer, Krista later arrived at the taped-off crime scene asking what was going on and if they had any suspects yet. The officer also noted that she appeared to be amused and giggly. Following the medical examiner's cleaning of Colleen's body, a pentagram etched into her chest became visible to investigators. This discovery, along with the description of the giggly young woman and statements by other Job Corps students, swiftly led them to Krista. Upon reviewing the campus sign-out records, authorities brought Krista, Tatterall, and Shadola in for questioning. All three willingly waived their Miranda rights and admitted to their involvement in Colleen's murder. As a result, they were apprehended and charged with capital murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Krista faced trial with the prosecution benefiting from both the evidence and her confession. Krista's defense relied heavily on her mental health. During the trial, Dr. Eric Ngum testified that he had examined Krista and found that she had no symptoms of brain damage or insanity, but did suffer from a very severe borderline personality disorder. On March 22, 1996, following just a few hours of deliberation, Krista was found guilty on all charges. A few days later, on March 30, she received a death sentence via electrocution. 
Krista showed little remorse in a letter to Tatterall after her conviction, expressing, Please write me. I miss you so much. You see what I get for trying to be nice to the hoe. I went ahead and bashed her brains out so she'd die quickly instead of letting her bleed to death and suffer more. And they fucking fry me. Ain't that some shit? Tatterall's ship was sentenced to life in prison, with an additional 25 years, including the possibility of parole. He received a less severe sentence due to being 17 years old at the time, making him ineligible for the death penalty. His defense also contended that while he took part in Colleen's torture, he did not deliver the final fatal blow. As for Shadola Peterson, she cooperated with investigators and, in exchange, received six years of probation. In June 2001, Krista Pike initiated an appeal for her conviction within the Tennessee state courts. Several significant events followed in the subsequent years. On August 24, 2001, a fellow inmate named Jennifer Shostecki set fire to their cell, creating a chaotic situation. Krista Pike, with assistance from another inmate, Natasha Cornett, who was serving three life sentences for the Lillilid family murders, seized the opportunity presented by the fire to attack yet another inmate, Patricia Ann Jones. Their intent was to strangle Patricia with a shoelace, and they came dangerously close to succeeding in their attempt. Krista claimed that Patricia Ann had been taunting her about her impending execution and, during a phone call to her mother, expressed her frustration with Patricia's behavior, accusing her of betrayal. She further told her mother that she knows the difference between premeditated murder and what happened to Slemmer because I premeditated the fuck out of this. If I had 30 more seconds, we would have a little chalk line out there in our wreck pen and that bitch would be gone. Normally, Krista was kept isolated, but the prison guards temporarily placed her, Natasha Cornett, and Patricia Ann Jones in the same recreation area due to the fire. Natasha initiated the attack on Patricia, and Krista joined in, strangling her with a shoelace until a correctional officer intervened. Krista was quoted as saying, I finally got a chance to kill you. I'm gonna die anyway. They can't do anything to me. In June 2002, Krista Pike abandoned her appeal and initially sought execution via electrocution. However, she later changed her mind, and on July 8, 2002, her lawyers filed a motion to continue the appeal process. The same year, Krista planned to marry Eric Gain, a collector and seller of serial killer memorabilia. Eric had begun writing letters to Krista in 1997, calling her, a hottie. He began selling their love letters, postcards, and anything else she would send him. While their romantic relationship has fizzled, he continues to sell her items on his website, including letters in which she fantasizes about killing people, and even used underwear. On August 12, 2004, she was convicted of attempted first-degree murder for the attack on inmate Patricia Ann Jones. In December 2008, Krista's request for a new trial was denied. In March 2012, two men, Justin Heflin, a former correctional officer, and Donald Coet, Krista's boyfriend, were arrested and charged with planning Krista Pike's escape. Justin Heflin was indicted on charges of bribery, official misconduct, conspiracy to commit escape, and facilitation to commit escape. Donald Coet faced bribery and conspiracy charges. The escape plan involved copying a prison key. Krista Pike was not charged, as her involvement in the plan was unclear. Donald Coet was sentenced to seven years in prison, and Justin Heflin cooperated with authorities after his arrest, serving no time. In April 2012, Krista Pike's lawyers filed a motion to overturn her attempted murder conviction, citing ineffective legal representation and insufficient evidence. They argued that she was defending her friend against a violent inmate rather than attempting murder but the appellate court rejected her appeal. In May 2014, Krista's legal team appealed in the federal court system, seeking to commute her death sentence to life in prison. They claimed that her previous attorneys were ineffective and that she should not face execution due to an organic brain injury, bipolar disorder, and PTSD. A neurologist attested that her frontal lobes were not correctly formed, affecting her ability to make moral decisions. However, on March 11, 2016, the U.S. District Judge rejected all grounds and denied the commutation of her death sentence. On August 22, 2019, Krista Pike's lawyers filed a similar appeal with the United States Court of Appeals.
but the three judges unanimously upheld the lower court ruling and denied relief. In 2021, a petition to stop the execution of Krista Pike in Tennessee was created and has collected 1,156 signatures as of October 2023. On August 30, 2023, Krista's attorneys filed a motion requesting that her post-conviction proceeding be reopened, claiming that her death sentence was unconstitutional. Their basis for this claim was a recent decision by the Tennessee Supreme Court, which deemed mandatory life sentences for juvenile offenders convicted of homicide to be unconstitutional. The motion also states that she was born with organic brain damage and a malformation of the brain caused by her mother's alcohol and drug use during pregnancy. Further explaining, that Krista suffers from bipolar disorder and severe PTSD due to repeated physical and sexual abuse as a child. November 7, 2023. Update. On November 1, 2023, Judge Scott Green rejected the request to reopen Krista's appeal and reduce her sentence. He clarified that the cited Tennessee Supreme Court decision specifically pertained to minors. Krista was 18 years old and considered an adult when she committed the crime of murdering Colleen. Krista's legal representatives have a 30-day window to challenge this ruling. An execution date has not been set. Tatterall Ship is eligible for release on October 21, 2026. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe.